it will be so nice when we can just go back to normal. Everywhere I go, I am feeling this overall eagerness, this sense of almost desperation to return to a baseline. The catchphrase new normal itself clings to a comfort word, the word normal, and it's gained so much popularity within these last months, and especially you hear it not only in media, but in casual conversations, and even as the restrictions continue to lift in many places. Where we live, the restrictions have only recently started to reduce, and many still remain, but we know that that could change at any time. No matter where you are in the world, all of our experiences within this pandemic have challenged us to think deeper about change in every single aspect of our lives. Whether it's testing our values, our relationships, coping strategies, financial situations, political views, and of course, what to do next in our schools. This actually got me thinking about what we could do in education to take what we have learned during this pandemic and not only change our schools, but truly transform them for the better. When I think of change, one of the things that comes to mind is the flight or fight response. This is where the amygdala in our brain triggers a series of effects on our bodies. And this is when we're presented with a stressful situation. The release of hormones that's provoked by potential danger increases our heart rate, it shortens our breath, and the blood vessels within our eyes and our muscles dilate in order to prepare us so that we can either fight the stressful situation head on or that we can flee it altogether. A doctor friend of mine explained that this is because this part of our brain helps us to focus on our survival. Our deepest worries that are brought on by so much uncertainty and quick shifts within these last two years are all potential triggers to kick our fight or flight response into high gear. And with our bodies on high alert, the subsequent and stress that we feel make it no wonder that we crave to go back to our comfort zones. And you know what? That's exactly what happened when we returned to our classrooms. As soon as we could get back into our buildings, it was common to see classrooms look quite similar, not only to how that they did pre-pandemic, but beginning of the 20th century. Only this time, the desks that were in rows were in support of social distancing requirements, and students working within the small groups were because they were in the same cohort, and this was done to reduce health risks. Since we were eager to get our students back with us in school, we did whatever we could to make that possible. However, mainstream classrooms cannot continue to look like this. As we transition back into our institutions, my concern is that we are missing a great opportunity to use this disruption as a catalyst to transform the many things we already knew needed to improve in education. In my view, is it a disservice to go back to business as usual? And you know why? Because we can't unknow what we know. And what we know is we learned so much about the potential of teaching and learning during this pandemic. We have accomplished things we never knew that we could. Teachers and students adapted quickly. They used tools of technology. They turned online teaching strategies, which evolved to keep students engaged. And we moved entire classrooms online to create a virtual community. We use technology and ways to connect with each other beyond physical spaces and even beyond time zones. And we collaborated through different platforms. More importantly, we exposed the deep need to focus on the social emotional needs and inclusion, which warranted our attention anyway. Some learners even thrived in this virtual environment especially those who had already were able to use their skills of high organization or manage socialing through a screen. However, we also uncovered learners who had these skills less developed, or maybe they faced other challenges from working at home. And these warranted the kinds of different skill gaps that may have widened or maybe even created new ones. These learners were not necessarily the same ones pre-pandemic either. This is why I am convinced that we cannot waste the open door that we have now to reimagine education completely, as well as all of our education institutions. 
Right now, anyone with an online account can post ideas on almost any social media platform within minutes of filming using their smart device. According to Statista.com, the current number of smartphone users in the world today is 6.648 billion, which means that 83.72% of the world's population owns a smartphone. And in February of 2020, we uploaded 500 hours of YouTube video every minute, which means that every hour, roughly 30,000 hours of newly uploaded content is available to consumers, and it is only increasing. Influencers are easily acceptable and with little guidance of how to navigate their ideas or how to decipher facts from opinions. So basically, if you're persuasive enough or attractive enough with any content or visuals, you can seem like an expert if you have enough likes or followers. And this is also learning. We trade conversations for texts and time in person with videos and audio messages. And when we lose interest, we can simply keep scrolling and we don't even have to walk away from the conversation as we might do within a coffee shop or even change classrooms when the bell rings. But this isn't necessarily all bad. I mean, if we're really taken with an area of interest, several virtual learning opportunities are available and offer complete degrees. They're just a credit card and a click away. Sophisticated al algorithms even send us more of what we might like or might be interested in. We can take master's courses with our favorite chefs or artists or even Ivy League schools are now within our reach. So really, it is not the technology or the platforms that help or hinder learning, but it's how we interact with them. And that is what we need from our schools. A whole set of people and places dedicated to helping learners work through content, engage with it, and safely explore the real world, both of them. The one online and the one outside your front door. I see an urgency to adapt schools before students risk thinking that they've outgrown them, especially when they can make money without needing a diploma or any strict permission to create and disperse content. What we need to do is to completely recast education. According to Oxford Dictionary, recasting is to change something by organizing it or presenting it in a different way. Now, when I think about the learning of the future, Recasting is fitting to me because it means we need to take what we know now in education and transform it into something new. And for that, we also need to give up the many traditional aspects of school that still exist today. The school of the future that I want to be a part of is one that inspires all of us as learners, not only to become the employees for jobs that don't even exist yet, but to become challenge accepted life explorers. And here are five intentions that I invite you to consider when we think about how to recast our schools. So first, we need to intentionally teach adaptability. And for that, I propose change drills, which are kind of like fire drills. Since our brains are hardwired for patterns and routines, this is why change can feel really stressful. But in these last two years, we have been living change, and those who have been most successful are those who can navigate it by seeing the opportunity that change brings, despite the very real and at times sometimes devastating challenges that it's caused. Currently, we know which classes that we will be in, and we will know which orders we will take those classes. So what if we recast our schedules so that at some point every day, we had a time slot devoted to change drills? This is where a surprise learning experience could take place. Maybe the change is also signaled by a bell or a sound. Change drill activities could be a menu of learning choices where students choose maybe a teacher that they interview, maybe it's a new learning technology tool, maybe they complete a dance challenge, maybe they even have a guided meditation session. Or maybe it's a collaboration challenge where students need to create a product using a predetermined set of materials with a goal and a set of instructions. They could be anywhere from five minutes to 20 minutes or even more, but the point is they're never at the same time or of the same duration. All anyone would know for sure is that a change drill will happen daily. Each experience would be accompanied by a guided discussion, and this is to talk through what they lived, what worked, what could be done differently, and how we felt about it. This practice has the potential to help 
us to adapt to change as environments change. So basically, it's just like practicing a routine sports drill so that you're able to draw on that skill no matter what happens in a game. Change drills can be built into our school days at any level and guided by leaders or teachers' teams. They could even be student-led. It could be differentiated for learners who have particular needs. And those planning it would keep it secret from those experiencing it until it happens. So it truly is an authentic practice for unexpected change. Change drills could help us explore alternatives. So we see change in a positive light rather than a stressful experience. The second is to intentionally teach empathy. Now, the idea of teaching empathy itself really isn't new, but in a culture where taking selfies and using filters is now becoming the standard, opportunities to express empathy as a skill needs to be priority. You see, empathy is how we will master the art of perspective taking, and this will enable us to consider which solutions that we apply to world problems and how we can help more people. In Dr. Michelle Borba's book, Unselfie, Why Empathetic Kids Succeed in an All-About-Me World, she mentions that through her experiences, she saw what research confirms, and that is that empathy can be cultivated. And in doing so, it transforms children's lives. She goes on to share that helping others is not a priority for tweens and teens today. In fact, according to a 2004 Harvard survey, teens ranked personal success, so achievement and happiness, higher over concern for others. To me, this is a scary me before you mentality. And what's more, the OECD framework stated that children who are entering school in 2018 will need to abandon the notion that resources are limitless and there to be exploited. They will need to be responsible and empowered and place collaboration above division and sustainability above short-term gain. This means that there is an urgency for us to help learners make the connection with how they impact the world around them. You know why? Because when young people are taught to care about all living things, then we all benefit. The third is we need to offer frequent and intentional opportunities for our learners to find their passion and connect it to a world outside their immediate experience. This means we need to expose learners to a wide variety and different kinds of experiences, not just hope that what we teach in our current programs will be enough for them to be successful. Through variety, we learn about what we like and what we're good at. But unfortunately, passions tend to be explored most frequently in after-school programs and sometimes in electives, and those do not take precedence in the regular school day. Additionally, and possibly a little more troublesome, some passions are explored completely unguided or with virtual guidance. This means that bringing in opportunities to explore passion and also keep students informed of the changing trends within the job markets today and in the future could definitely use some time to be addressed. For this, we need to bump up exposure to authentic and relevant learning experiences from various fields so that we can help learners understand what is the real world. We need to teach curiosity, not creativity. Creativity is what we inspire when we help students discover passion and help them think about what's next based on what's now. For this, they will need the potential to be ready for not only joining the workforce, but being able to shape it. The fourth, we need to intentionally teach personal branding using technology. So just like an effective leader changes their leadership style according to those they are leading, Effective learners know how they are unique and how they can promote their person with appropriate technology choices. According to 2022 Future of Education report, two-thirds of global employers think that candidates could do a better job articulating their skills more clearly. Knowing that we need strong communication itself to be successful really isn't new, but learning how to identify our talents and how to communicate them to the audience that we want to impact certainly could be something that we improve. The current resumes today that are accepted by employers also need to evolve so that candidates can demonstrate their range of skills, not just list them. An employer can learn so much from a prospective employee 
by simply experiencing the choices that they make when using a tech-based resume. A candidate could create a recording showing their knowledge of languages or a video demonstrating their skills in a particular area of expertise, and this will help them make their abilities evident. This kind of show me and not just tell me sets the stage for the following interview. Though many platforms already have these capabilities, we still do not use them as the generally accepted curriculum vitae. This form that I'm proposing of personal branding requires learners to know themselves and their talents really well, but also understand the delicate balance between confidence and humility when attracting employers or future customers so they can communicate what they know and what they're able to do. This last intention, this fifth, this one is to intentionally teach teachers how to address these four. It has been said that teachers are essential because that is how we learn all other professions. We currently have artificial intelligence that feels more and more human to help us, but they will never be us. We need to teach teachers, and they are leaving the profession for all kinds of important reasons, including pay, respect, stress. The OECD states that teachers are the most important school-related factor that influences student learning. And in John Hattie's 2018 list of factors related to student achievement, it demonstrates that all of these experiences and strategies which have an impact on learning are the vast majority in which teachers themselves can influence. This means that as leaders, we need to build time in weekly so that teachers can share ideas and plan for these intentions collaboratively, together. According to Hattie's work, collective teacher efficacy, it has the highest impact on student learning. We need to build a culture where teachers' social and emotional well-being is supported. Because when they are taken care of, they can model these strategies to the learners who are in their care. As an educator for over 20 years, and I'm and working in different teaching and leadership and support roles, I've worked in different locations around the world. And the one thing that I've learned is if there was one best way of doing school, everybody would be doing it. We need to abandon the idea that school is a place where subjects are taught separately and lean into a school becoming a challenge accepted learning environment that is based on the lens of student passion. At my school, we have already begun this journey, and we're looking forward to exploring more and more of these ideas. I invite you to also consider these five intentions as we recast schools and move forward. We can all contribute to the future design of our schools, whether you are a student, an educator, a parent, or an employer. Together, we can become challenge-accepted life explorers and truly recast the schools of the future. Thank you.